Hey everybody, Chris Pearson here with Nebulosity. Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to the neighborhood. Speaking of the neighborhood, you can see behind me here, a lot of cars, a lot of traffic. It's gonna be like that. It is a very mild Saturday night here in the Northern Hemisphere in the light polluted skies of the DC metro region. But that's what this channel is all about. An amateur astrophotographer, you know, trying to shoot deep space objects in heavily light polluted skies. So not scared whatsoever. We're gonna go after it. In fact, we're going after two different objects. The first being my absolute favorite night sky object year round, no doubt whatsoever, the Pleiades cluster. M45, Messier 45 in the Messier catalog, or the Seven Sisters as it's more commonly referred to as. Look guys, I saw this back in college, you know, at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, where we had a planetarium. And uh, my astronomy professor, he pulled up the night sky and there it was. And I just fell in love right then and there. And in terms of the distance, we're talking 440 light years away. Not 440,000, not 440 million, 440 light years away. That means the light that emitted from these really hot blue stars uh, emitted back in the late 1500s. Just a very, very close object in astronomical terms. And because of that, it's very bright. You can look up in the sky in most places ar around the Northern Hemisphere and see it with your naked eye. It's just that big and that bright. So that's gonna be the first object. The second object is going to be the, well, objects, I should say, the Heart and Soul Nebulae. Now, these two uh, deep space objects are emission gas clouds, hydrogen gas, ionized gas, very, very hot uh, around a grouping of sort of variable stars. And it's located up in the constellation Cassiopeia. So you can look it up on Stellarium. Uh, both of these objects can be fit into one frame. If you've got a full frame camera, a full frame camera sensor rather, you're gonna be able to get those very easily in there. Uh, any, any sort of you know, focal length between 135 millimeters all the way out to 250, 300, you'll be able to get these in there. Uh, I'm gonna be shooting with an APS-C crop sensor, uh, which is a little bit tighter, so it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge to get all of it in there, but you know, fingers crossed, we're able to squeeze them in there and still you know, have some nice sh sharp stars and a lot of contrast uh, between these two you know, emission nebulae. So that's the, that's the general sort of scope of this uh, episode. Just a couple of other things on Pleiades that I think is important from sort of a scientific perspective. Let me, let me nerd out here for a second. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this open cluster is that these stars are massive and they're burning super hot. Uh, thus the blue, uh, they're, they're just burning so much hotter, infinitely hotter uh, than our own sun, uh, which is a, you know, it's a relatively smaller stable star. That's a good thing for us. It's gonna be around between four to eight billion years, so we don't have to worry about anything. But these stars up in the Pleiades cluster are, are very hot. Uh, not to say that they're unstable, but their lifespans are a fraction of what our own sun is going to be. Uh, somewhere between 100 to 250 million years, and boom, they're gone. So even though you know, we think of space as something that's static and doesn't really change, it does, uh, certainly over a larger time scale and larger distances, but the fact that those stars are gonna be gone long before our own sun, you know, just gives us a little bit more perspective on the night sky and just how dynamic it is, you know, uh, from one millennia to another and sort of, you know, 100 million years from now, what it will look like uh, versus what it looks like today. So I think that's really cool. Um, hopefully, you know, at some point in the future, people will be looking at all of our pictures and using that for scientific purposes. Um, but in any event, let's go ahead and take a look at the, the technical gear and, and specs that we're gonna be using tonight to capture these two objects. Okay, so here we are. Uh, we've got my basic setup and um, pretty much most of the gear is very similar to what you've seen in my previous videos, but just a quick recap. I've got the HEQ5 Pro by Skywatcher. This is a German equatorial mount with a couple of clutches uh, that allows me to tilt on a declination and right ascension axes, uh, multiple axes. This is a wonderful product. It's relatively inexpensive. I think it's still on the market. Uh, it's relatively light. I can show you here, uh, even you know with everything connected to it, well, it's still got some weight to it, but overall, you know, I can't complain. It's, it's definitely portable. Uh, you know, you can get a, a cart or wheels to put on the bottom of if you need to move it around, but overall, it's, it's not that bad uh, as far as, you know, mounts are concerned. Now, another piece of equipment I've got here just real quick is the Pegasus Powerbox Pro. Now, I had the Pocket Powerbox. I still do, actually. I'm going to continue using it, but this is a new piece of equipment I picked up not too long ago. Uh, it's got a new ST4 cable adapter to 
uh, humid a humidity sensor here, and this is really important because this guy controls the uh, the amount of energy that goes to my dew heater straps on the telescope and the guiding scope. Really important, especially in winter. If you get fogged up, you're not going to be able to get good guiding or good images for that matter. So this helps to regulate that power distribution really well. It's also got a couple of USB 3 ports on the side as well as a PC port if you wanted to do your uh, your imaging through a computer or laptop. Um, I don't use it for that. I really use it more for power distribution, but overall, wonderful, uh, wonderful little uh, product here. You know, can't recommend sort of Pegasus products enough. Okay, last but not least, we have the Red Cat 51 uh, by William Optics, as well as the 50 millimeter guide scope by William Optics up top here. The Red Cat 51 I've been featuring for, I guess, the last year or so. Uh, it's a wonderful telescope. Uh, it's at 250 millimeter focal length, so very, very wide field. And uh, on the back here, I've got the ZWO ASI 2600 MC Pro. This is a one-shot color camera, very similar to a digital camera. You take a picture and you get all the colors uh, across the visible, visible uh, spectrum. But it's just a powerful, powerful uh, overall you know, camera. It's a, it's a new generation of, of astronomy, dedicated astronomy cameras. It's got a cooler built into it can drop it down to minus 20 degrees Celsius. So on a winter night, this thing just is absolutely great because you're getting out here, it's freezing cold. Uh, you wanna set up, get things in, get back in the house, get warm. So uh, you also don't have to worry about with the one-shot color dealing with uh, multiple uh, filters and filter wheels and adapters and all of that. So I've got a ID ASD2 light pollution suppression filter here in the uh, imaging train and that's gonna really help to block out the LED lights that I've talked about in previous episodes across the street i just got a ton of led lights so and overall uh, it's going to be run here off of the asi air pro uh, this is not the newest version but it's the second newest version of this particular mini pc uh, it's absolutely wonderful it runs the imaging it runs the camera it runs the heq5 pro in terms of the polar alignment and everything else so couldn't do it without this little guy here. Uh, I've got a USB stick in here where it downloads all the data and I run that into the house and the end of the imaging sh you know, shoot, take my flats, take my darks, take my calibration frames as they're known and uh, produce my images. So the ASI Air products by ZWO are really, really great. Um, you know, there's so many other products out there, but this is one that I can speak to. So this is, this is the setup that we're gonna use to capture Pleiades, the heart, the Sol Nebula, everything you see is gonna be based off of uh, this little setup. So. Uh, you know, it's the holiday season. If you're looking to get, get something new, uh, you, you can't go wrong with this particular setup. It's been great for me. And, uh, you know, hopefully if you guys have got it out there, it's, it's doing wonderful things for you too. Whew, welcome back. Uh, I had to run in to get some clothes because the sun went down and it got cold. Uh, Mother Nature turns very quickly here in Maryland. And you know what? That's just the way it is. Got to be prepared. Now, speaking of Mother Nature, uh, the clouds are still up there, but they're gonna be clearing out pretty soon, probably another 30 minutes to an hour before we hit that clear uh, clear sky. Now, there are two updates that I wanna talk about this year with respect to the ASI Air Pro, this mini computer. When I first bought it, when you were running uh, auto guiding, it focused on one star. And not too long ago, the firmware was up, upgraded so that it's now focusing on multiple stars or multi-star guiding. And I talked about in a previous video just how much of a game changer that was. Instead of you know trying to match up what's the, that one star doing and sending small pulses to this uh, auto guiding system through you know the the German equatorial mount, it's focused on multiple stars, and that just made it much much more accurate and, and it could fine tune those signals. Well. There was another game changer that came out not too long ago, and that is uh, the times two binning. Now, binning is basically, it has to do with resolution. You know, your, your sensor has uh, many, many pixels on it, where it's collecting light through every one of those light wells. And normally it's one-to-one -one binning, so every single pixel is getting light, and whatever's coming through this guide scope is what's coming through. The light's going to look, uh, you know, whatever it is, whether the stars are very bloated or very dim. A one-to-one -one binning is sort of a native resolution. But with times two binning, what happens is, instead of one pixel being one pixel, the system will take a two by two matrix or four pixels in, in a square and compress them into one. And by doing that, it can make adjustments to the, the quality of the image coming in, or in this case, the stars. They can be a little bit more round, a little more tight, and that creates more accurate 
uh, auto guiding. And in this particular case, I'm now down to below 0.5 arc seconds of error on average, which is tremendous. Uh, when I started out, I was at 1.5, 1.25. Eventually, with the multi-star guiding, I got down below 1 on average, and now I'm getting below 0.5. And keep in mind, I have not hyper-tuned this thing. I haven't changed out the belts, the gears. Uh, everything that you see here is a stock product. So the fact that we're getting you know, that good of an auto-guiding with an entry-level mount, not a multi-thousand dollar observatory-grade mount, is just phenomenal and it really opens up new doors you know as i want to get into longer uh, exposure uh, astrophotography for objects that are perhaps more dim you know eight minutes nine minutes ten minutes that kind of accuracy is really going to allow me to take those exposures uh, the limitation is going to be of course my light pollution there's not much i can do about that but at least if i get out to a darker site with the setup i'm gonna have more confidence that i'll be able to take those longer exposures uh, with this particular you know setup so anyway uh, let's see. The clouds are just starting to dissipate. Let's get back to this project. But in the meantime, I hope you guys are doing well and uh, we'll check back in at the end of the video. Hey everybody, welcome back. So we're at the end of the shoot and after four to six weeks, I'm happy to report that we got a lot of data. I got around 400 exposures, actually more than 400, but I sort of cut it down to 400 three minute exposures on the Pleiades cluster, that broadband target. And as we go into Astro Pixel Processor and look here, we can see the object. There's a lot of light pollution. That right hand side is really facing towards the Washington DC area, whereas the other portion of it is facing north towards actually towards Cherry Spring State Park and that whole region of the United States. So much darker on that side of the image. But, you know, these are things that we can fix in post. I think the important thing is just seeing how much depth in terms of the dust clouds and, uh, you know, the, the star cluster in general are popping out from this image, just pouring on the data and selecting the best data, not keeping all of it was really important. So that's the big takeaway for me uh, when you're shooting broadband targets, you know, trying to shoot somewhere in that 60 to zenith range in terms of the uh you know the altitude of the, of the of the object anything here in dc below 50 degrees 40 degrees you really get washed out quite a bit so shooting high in the sky really important keeping the very best of the data possible um, the other thing i would recommend is perhaps going with shorter exposures you know three minutes is a lot for this object you, you know i could easily have done two minutes or 90 seconds uh, so that's something I'll play around with in the future. But these are things you can fix and post with sort of star reduction and things of that nature. So overall, pretty happy with the, the initial output from Astro Pixel Processor. And uh, at the end of the video, we'll take a look at the, the final image. Now, with regards to the uh, Heart and Soul Nebula, uh, as this image is pulling up, I can tell you that we were able to get somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, three to four hundred five minute exposures. Uh, I, I sort of, you know, cut it down again from a good five, six hundred uh, frames overall. So a lot of data here, and because it's narrow band, it's just a, it's a lot easier to to deal with both in pre and post processing. Now, as you can see here, you know, it's pretty dim. Uh, the contrast is is there, but it's just not popping out as much. That's because I've only applied a very light stretch here. I haven't done any of the uh, heavy post process editing. But there's enough data in this, you know, stacked image. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, the final uh, image is going to really, really have some good quality content in there. So I'm very happy with this one as well. And overall, uh, both objects, again, begin, beginner friendly, 
things that you can go after in your first year of astrophotography. You don't have to have a big dedicated astro camera. You can go after these objects even with a DSLR uh, and, a, and a telescope as long as you've got you know a good location and you've got some sort of auto guiding you know uh, setup whether it's through an equatorial mount uh, your off-axis guiders, your guide scopes, that's really going to be the ticket there and making sure that you're getting the right exposure time and uh, as, as best tracking as you possibly can get. So at the end of the day, this was a very successful shoot. I think both of these objects really came out uh, better, than an ex better than expected shooting in this light dome of the DC metro region and just really happy overall. So look, happy holidays to all of you guys. Uh, I'm about to go on a, an extended vacation with my family. Very excited about that. I hope all of you guys are having time you know, with your friends and family to sort of kick back enjoy the end of the year and i look forward to seeing all of your year and wrap up photos and everything on instagram and other parts of social media uh, as we sort of wrap up here this 2021 and look to 2022 so a lot uh, a lot to come in the new year we'll see you then until then take care